April the 15th, 2019. The wooden frame and roof of Notre Dame caught fire. 1,200 oak beams nicknamed the forest. A forest fire, the cathedral's weak point. And yet, despite the apparent fragility, the frame was robust and indispensable. The weight of the frame held everything together. Without this pressure point, the side walls of the cathedral would have had to withstand the thrust of the vaults on the inside and the thrust of the buttresses on the outside. Not necessarily everywhere, only at certain points. So the weight of the whole frame ensured the adherence of the whole and prevented the walls undergoing too much strain. The frame was a real plus point for the safety of the cathedral. We knew that if ever there was a problem with fire, then the frame would indeed burn, but it would save the building. That's part of its DNA, built into its design by the master masons of the 12th and 13th centuries. The forest of Notre Dame was designed to self-destruct in the event of fire. It no longer exists, but it was identical to the frame of the Cathedral of Notre Dame of Rouen, one of the most perfect examples of its time. The best techniques could be found in Rouen, as well in most wooden frames in the kingdom at the time. Everything was coordinated between the master mason and the master carpenter. There was an overall design. Notre Dame's wooden frame had already been rebuilt once. Why did the cathedral's master mason and the carpenters decide on this structure? And how can we explain its resilience for eight centuries? The answers to these questions can be found in what happened during the night of August the 14th, 1218. On the eve of the holy day of the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, thieves broke into the premises of Notre Dame's cannons. One source identifies one of these thieves as an Englishman. Um, they crept up into the upper parts of the cathedral and tried to sort of levy themselves down to steal these sacred uh, liturgical vestments and vessels in the night. And something went wrong, a candlestick of some sort was knocked over and the choir caught fire. Notre Dame caught fire for the first time in its history. We don't really know the full consequences of this fire but it helped to launch a huge campaign of new work during the 1220s. During the same period, the construction of the Cathedral of Chartres was coming to an end. It had enormous windows, whereas Notre Dame didn't. And then, all of a sudden, Notre Dame apparently needed changing, modernizing and upgrading. You can imagine the sort of site meeting with the master mason, with the stonecutters and the other artisans saying, just give us the order. We've been to Chartres, seen what they've done there, and we can do better. Doing better meant letting more light in by opening Notre Dame's windows, a new challenge for the medieval builders. It meant modifying the roof, and completely rebuilding the wooden frame. It was a structure which was over 100 meters long, 10 meters high, 13 meters wide, and worryingly unstable. A wooden frame has a major impact on the stability of a building, as it creates pressure points and a great deal of thrust points. Pressure points carried chiefly to the sides by rafters. Rafters are the very long beams of wood that support the roof covering. They carry the weight to the outside. It's important to have joists at the base, which are pieces of wood linking the rafters, and which will reduce the spread of the frame. 
If the whole device is not solid enough, the frame will push down onto the stonework and the section could collapse. The main problem with the first frame was that the vaults were inside the frame. This prevented adding any joists, which would prevent the spread of the frame. How could this mistake be rectified? The only solution was to build the wall higher and enable the new frame to have horizontal joists fitted in order to stabilize the overall structure. Other elements were added to share the load exerted by the large mass of wood and to reinforce it. The only material that could be used in this consolidation plan was the most noble of woods, oak. Oakwood has an exceptional elasticity, mechanical resistance, and an extraordinary durability. What we're concerned with is a consistency between the part of the tree which is cut and the piece of wood that is produced, since each tree provides a single piece of wood. One tree produces a single piece of wood, so the trees have to be not only solid, but enormous. The joists span the roof triangle horizontally and cross the whole building. So for a nave with a width of 13 meters, the joist must be 50 centimeters longer at each end, and thus tree trunks of at least 14 meters are necessary. It's estimated that between 1,000 and 2,000 oaks were required to construct the wooden frame of Notre Dame. Where did they find such tall trees and in such quantities? The medieval solution was to be found in a long forgotten technique. Trees were clear cut and the stumps were allowed to grow again. So forests could spring up again and keep producing wood. This know-how enabled trees to grow quicker, higher, thinner and straighter as they sought out the light. After 50 to 60 years, the wood was perfectly ready for the building of cathedral frames and could be cut down. This clever technique reduced the area that needed to be deforested. The scientists estimate that only three to four hectares of forests were required to build Notre Dame's frame. This is the equivalent to three times the area of the cathedral square. The carpenters worked with axes on the young, freshly cut wood, which made the jobs of squaring and right angling much easier. The squaring followed the natural lines of the wood, giving it an unbeatable solidity. If you follow my finger, you can see that the fiber has stayed intact. These pieces of wood have remained in exactly the same shape as they grew, and so they cannot be deformed. All these pieces of wood, which ensured the solidity of the frame, were then assembled on a platform above the vaults. The forest of Notre Dame was completed during the 1220s, and protected the building from bad weather for eight centuries. It's a mark of its flawless resistance. It also supported the striking lead roof, the steep, slender structure visible to all. The roof covering could be seen for miles. For a long time, it was covered in gold leaf. This made it gleam in the sun, but it also shone out in moonlight. Once the monumental roof had been completed, all that was left was to complete the towers of the cathedral. These huge towers became the face of Notre Dame. At 69 meters high, they became the tallest buildings in Paris. The function of these two towers isn't just aesthetic. The towers can be sighted from miles and miles away, but they can also be heard. So it's important to remember that these aren't just visible signs of power. They're ways of transmitting the power of Notre Dame through sound, too. 
Notre Dame's towers were erected during the decades of 1230 and 1240. It wasn't until the construction of the Eiffel Tower, 650 years later in 1889, that any building superseded them. When the towers were completed, the whole of Notre Dame was finally ready to welcome its faithful, almost 70 years after it was started. However, more work was deemed necessary. 